Okay, so we're getting ready to, uh, to start. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, webinar today. It's uh, really exciting to know that we have people joining from different countries, from uh, Brazil, of course, but also from uh, other parts of the world, India, Italy, I know, and there might be other countries around. Uh, my name is Livia Cabral. I'm a research fellow at uh, the Institute of Development Studies, and I'll be chairing uh, this webinar today. Uh, this is being hosted by IVS and the uh, Brazil Group at the University of Sussex, and uh, in collaboration with the uh, Social Sciences Postgraduate Program in uh, Development, Agriculture and Society, known as uh, CPDA for short, based at the Federal Rural University of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the AgroEchos project, which we'll hear about, the Solidarity Economy Forum of Baixada Santista, and uh, the Ibirapitanga Institute. So uh, the seminar is part of a uh, series that we started last uh, year, uh, focused on um, food equity, and which is now starting its second edition. And uh, it is uh, our great pleasure to, uh, to kick start with a really nice panel of speakers that includes uh, Claudia Schmidt from uh, CPDA, she'll be joining us shortly. Uh, Les Levidal from uh, the Open University and um, uh, principal investigator of uh, the AgroEchos uh, project, uh, which you'll hear about. Uh, Andres uh, Degenschein from Ibirapitanga. And I will introduce the speakers shortly uh, in, in, uh, in uh, detail. But um, first, before uh, we actually start, let me just give a a little bit of background on, on the seminar. Uh, so needless to say that uh, the COVID uh, crisis has been uh, uh, very traumatic for many, for those who have lost um, loved ones, for those who have experienced the illness and its long-term uh, effects, those who have lost jobs and other sources of livelihoods. And in many countries, Brazil included, children have been out of school for months uh, or many children have, and they've not only seen their education and future compromise, but they've also lost access to their main meal of the day. Uh, according to the global monitoring of uh, school meals during COVID school closures, 260 million children are currently missing out on, uh, on daily school meals that they depend on. And uh, here in the UK, um, we watch in horror <laughs> pledges uh, being made to increase the uh, defense budget while poor children are being denied um, food, uh, free uh, school meals during, during the holiday period. So the inequalities that are being generated by the, the pandemic are quite uh, disturbing. Uh, the World Bank uh, has estimated that the, uh, the pandemic will push uh, uh, 49 million people into extreme poverty this year. And uh, early evidence collected by the uh, International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, shows how the poor's food and, and nutrition security is affected disproportionately, mainly because of the impact of the pandemic on physical labor on disposable income. So the picture is, we know, very grim. Uh, and yet, I think there's reasons to be hopeful. And the seminar today is, uh, I hope, <laughs> very much about hope. Uh, since the start of the pandemic, we've, um, we've seen uh, expressions of solidarity around the world, uh, especially as a reaction to the failure by governments to deal with the crisis uh, adequately, not least in Brazil. Uh, so this seminar looks into some of these experiences, focusing specifically on localized food networks that have responded quite promptly to the pandemic. And these are networks operating at a local scale and building on uh, years of struggles of, for justice um, from below. Uh, and these networks have strengthened and shortened connections between supply and demand, bringing together consumers to uh, producers, often with the help of digital platforms. And the, the proximity that, um, that has been created has allowed, um, as we'll hear, uh, for additional features or functions to be added to food transactions, being the emphasis on reciprocity and relations of trust, the emphasis on fresh, seasonal and healthy food and placing food in, their, in, in its territory, and also raising consumer awareness about the social ecological footprint of food. So uh, we will hear about different types of such networks in Brazil and how they've been operating who is behind them, what they have achieved, what challenges they have faced, and, and what support they, uh, they need moving forward. 
And I hope that also more broadly, the panel will help us uh, reflect on how these experiences from Brazil can uh, contribute to, um, to making food systems more equitable. So our three speakers will uh, talk for about uh, 40 minutes overall, and then we'll open up for rounds of questions from the audience. Um, so we'll hopefully fit the first round before, before the hour. And you can, mean, in the meantime, use the, uh, the chat box to introduce yourselves or to make comments. And there's also a Q&A function uh, in the, um, the tab below where you can start uh, typing your questions. If you do so, uh, please uh, uh, add your, your name and organization. Um, I should also say that the seminar is being recorded and the recording will be available from tomorrow on uh, the IDS webpage linked to the event. Uh, the link to this webpage is going to be available in the chat box uh, shortly. So let me first introduce then uh, our, um, our speaker, first speaker, uh, Claudia Schmidt, who's just joined us. Uh, good morning, Claudia. Uh, Claudia is assistant professor at CPDA at the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro. She has worked as advisor and consultant to um, non-governmental and governmental organizations on a range of issues related to the formulation and implementation of public policies. Claudia works in the field of sociology and rural development, focusing on family farming, agroecology, social movements, food and nutrition security and, and sovereignty and local markets. So Claudia, welcome. Good morning to you and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. I will try, first of all, uh, say that's a pleasure to be, to be here to talk a little bit about uh, the network uh, initiatives ongoing in Brazil. And I'll, I'll try to share here a little bit my my screen. I don't know. Am I able to share it myself? Uh, you should be. Yes. Okay. okay. Oh. Mm. Well. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll find it. A little bit of problems here. You you could find a share screen function, right? Oh you yeah, no yes, yes, yes. The share screen is here. Let's see. Can you see that? If you can just put in the uh, presenting presenters mode, that'd be great. Mm. Can you see that? Yes, perfect. Okay. Go ahead. So um, uh, this this work started a little bit with a collaboration with Lydia that we started writing a little bit on what was going on on. Uh, food production and localized networks in, in Brazil. And then it grew a little bit more to a, a more detailed research under the possibilities we have to do research under the pandemic. And then um, we were able to aggregate uh, other uh, people and uh, researchers. So the results I will, I will present here are also uh, an outcome of a collective work of a broad group that we are trying to really uh, uh, monitor and also reflect on what's going on uh, in relation to food uh, initiatives. Um, first of all, I think it's important uh, to talk real quickly uh, about uh, our trajectory uh, before the pandemic. Because in Brazil, uh, we had uh, in 1988, the approval of a, a democratic constitution and uh, the democratization of the country after the military government. And since the middle of 1990s, uh, we had um, a cycle of um, 
social policies and uh, policies uh, targeting uh, the strengthening uh, of uh, family farming uh, agriculture starting uh, with PRONAF, that was a progr program in, uh, created in 1996 to strengthen family farming. And then we had, a, we can say we had a, a cycle of policies uh, combining social policies, family farming, family farm support policies, and also uh, some specific uh, policy instruments uh, in order to uh, enhance uh, organic farming and, um, and agriculture. So um, we were in this track until say 1912, 1913, and um, then um, already with some uh, problems due to the end of, end of the uh, uh, very favorable cycle of uh, commodities uh, at global level where Brazil was engaged in um, this uh, ex uh, Brazilian exports, particularly from agribusiness were also in the one hand, uh, they were driving the expansion of uh, monoc monocultures and um, with high uh, impact, both socially and uh, ecologically, but also uh, the possibility of uh, financing uh, public policies. I, I will not go over all this um, confluence of uh, economic crisis and political crisis uh, we had, uh, particularly after the impeachment of uh, President uh, Dilma Rousseff. But uh, what's important to, to notice is that uh, during this period, uh, we had sort of a, a double-sided policies. We had public, public policies targeting uh, and um, agribusiness and we had uh, but we also had uh, increasing investments in family farm policies and uh, it's important to highlight that in brazil uh, family farming is responsible for a large share of domestic uh, supply of a variety of, of foods in terms of results these are just to give you some context uh, we we had uh, um, interesting results uh, in relation to fighting uh, poverty, food insecurity, um, as well as uh, inequality in this uh, cycle. Uh, but also um, commodities né, uh, for export uh, keep uh, increasing their share, not only on ex exports, but uh, also uh, in a high territorial impact in different regions of the country. And now, uh, before pandemics, we were in this uh, atmosphere, in this uh, moment, where we had uh, uh, an economic crisis. Uh, we have uh, enhancement of austerity measures, particularly from 2016 on, and an active, uh, say an active uh, policy of what we were trying to study here in CPDA of policy dismantling. Right? We have a very aggressive uh, effort of dismantling of uh, public, public security policies and family farm policies, and also of a whole structure of uh, participatory uh, bodies, uh, of participatory arenas, where um, government officials and uh, representatives from civil society were able to discuss these policies, not only in the environmental side, but in food security, uh, education, and different, uh, different, different areas of public policy. So this picture is very uh, emblematic because this, is, this was a manifestation uh, that uh, was called the banquetasso or the big feast. Uh, related to the extinction of the National uh, Council of Food Security and Nutrition, the CONSEIA. Né? This was a national body uh, associated to the presidents of the Republic that was uh, extinct in the first uh, months of the governor Bolsonaro. So uh, we were, what I want to highlight uh, in this very uh, quick effort to give you some context is that before the pandemics, we were already in a very complicated process of uh, policy dismantling, 
uh, and of uh, also uh, authoritarian measures related to all the whole system of uh, participation that was one of the strengths of uh, Brazilian uh, public policy. So um, when the uh, pandemics came, uh, we, um, we were at this point, uh, there was the approval by the Congress of uh, emer emergency, uh, emergency policy for uh, uh, the transfer, it was a cash transfer policy for uh, families uh, that, were, that were unemployed or in informal employment and, uh, and, and all of that. In the, fir in the first moment, it was uh, this support was of 600 reais and uh, now we are in the, end of, uh, in the end of a cycle of 300 reais support policies per month. Uh, but uh, COVID is still there. Now we, has, we have already 6 million uh, cases, 169,000, almost 170,000 uh, deaths. Um, and uh, no, there is no, uh, a clean, there is not a clear horizon of how public policies uh, will uh, work from now on. So this is, I mean, the green, <laughs> very, uh, gray uh, atmosphere and gray, very gray context and then I will move to more uh, interesting things related to the uh, action of the networks and um, solidarity. So um, as soon as the, the, pan, the, the isolation measures starts, started and uh, one first things that happened was that many uh, fairs and uh, places, uh, open places for uh, selling food, uh, they had to close or they had uh, restrictions. Uh, people had to go go home, like in, in other countries, particularly in the, in the first uh, stage of the pandemic. Um, and then we started to identify in all parts of the country, uh, many, many uh, efforts, many, many uh, initiatives uh, connecting uh, production, producers and consumers and distributing uh, food. In our research, uh, we studied seven, seven different initiatives that come from different organizations. Uh, um, and I will present them very quickly here. Uh, we studied the actions of uh, Rede Ecológica, that's a consumer network acting here in Rio. Uh, uh, as Lydia highlighted, this, this network uh, has a long story of uh, decades uh, working, uh, connecting consumers and producers, uh, and uh, has done a lot of uh, important work uh, during the pandemic not only uh, guaranteeing that farmers, uh, small farmers were able to sell their uh, ecological products, but also uh, distributing food in, commu uh, in communities under uh, food insecurity. Um, the other organization that we, uh, that we tried to study was the Center of Integration of Serra da Misericórdia. Uh, the same, uh, same works uh, here in Rio de Janeiro in a, a complex of favelas. Uh, they work in the complex, uh, the Complexo do Alemão, but they also uh, work in a region they call uh, Complexo da Penha. And they promote uh, urban agriculture, um, uh, uh, the consumption of healthy food, and selling also uh, processed products, not only coming from farmers, but also from people who, who live uh, in the favelas. The other organization uh, we are studying at the level of Rio de Janeiro is the movement of small farmers, the MPA. The MPA is a national movement that has been working, working for decades on um, uh, eco uh, sustainability, ecological agriculture, and uh, the defense of uh, farmers' rights. And here in Rio de Janeiro, uh, they are doing a very significant uh, work, uh, not only uh, supplying food for uh, consumers in general, mostly middle-class consumers, but also in the implementation uh, of uh, what uh, they call the popular councils of um, food supply. 
in the favelas. So they are working in several places in Rio de Janeiro. It's uh, in connection uh, with uh, or, or urban organizations that work uh, at the territory. Uh, and they are trying not only to face uh, the inse food insecurity problems during the pandemic, but move uh, to really uh, implement a network of food supply uh, connecting uh, farmers and people uh, who are in this uh, peripheral uh, territories in Rio de Janeiro. Another uh, initiative that we have been trying to study uh, was the initiative set up by a, a youth movement called uh, Movimenta Caxias. The Movimenta Caxias uh, is a um, is a network of networks of uh, um, uh, youth uh, movements and organizations uh, working uh, with uh, racial issues, gender issues, uh, the visibility of um, social action uh, within the favelas. And they did this, this is very interesting because they did not have the tradition of working with uh, food. But with the pandemics, uh, many um, uh, started a very severe problem not only of food but also of housing uh, in the region uh, around Rio de Janeiro called uh, Baixada Fluminense because housing because people were not able to uh, in this new condition and the problems with work they were not able anymore to pay their rent so a lot of people were out of their houses uh, and they made a huge effort with the support of a foundation called the uh, Unibanco Foundation to distribute uh, not only conventional food, but also to network with farmers that produce uh, ecological food in the uh, peri-urban areas of Rio de Janeiro. And part of the food that they were able to distribute to these communities was also uh, healthy food. So. Uh, as you see, we, we can, uh, in these four organizations, we see different trajectories uh, working uh, with food, both in rural areas and in urban areas. And I think one of the most uh, interesting thing was the ability, né? here we are talking only about the organizations, uh, the initiatives in Rio de Janeiro, né? Uh, to connect uh, in a very harsh environment, in a very difficult environment, because Rio de Janeiro is a huge metropolis, rural areas uh, are being uh, destructed, uh, are, are being uh, destroyed by this uh, uh, urban speculation and the uh, and the uh, urban sprawl. So you have uh, really little patches of rural areas né? and these networks were able through this action to connect these little patches of rural areas and to deliver uh, food in territories where it's also very hard to work where you have uh, a lot of territorial restrictions due to violence that 30 percent of the area of rio de janeiro is controlled either by uh, traffic uh, uh, traffic uh, groups, the drug traffic, or by the militias. So uh, really the effort they put up, were able to put up during the pandemic was very, uh, I mean, it was very notable, very, very important. The other three initiatives that we uh, tried to, to study um, was the agroecological basket of Valley of Mambucaba, uh, uh, that's in a, in a middle range city of uh, Angra dos Reis in Rio de Janeiro. The initiatives that were built uh, by um, a network of uh, labor unions and farmers associations and cooperatives uh, at uh, Polo da Borborema in Paraíba, northeastern Brazil, uh, connecting small, uh, mostly uh, small and middle sized uh, cities and the uh, initiatives uh, held by Coletivo Triunfo together with ISPTA uh, at Paraná, uh, that's a state in southern Brazil, and highlighting that these initiatives also involve uh, working with uh, biodiversity and also with uh, native of uh, Creole seeds, 
uh, and the seeds were also distributed to farmers during the pandemic uh, to make sure that people were able not only to uh, have access to consumption, but also that farmers, poor farmers were able to keep uh, producing uh, food during this uh, period. Huh? So um, I, I now, we won't have time to go over all these initiatives, uh, but uh, I will try to talk a little bit about uh, what uh, we were able to see looking uh, now at this uh, several, se seven localized uh, networks acting uh, during the pandemics and uh, what uh, we can highlight uh, the most. Huh? I think there are uh, some uh, recent developments uh, ongoing. We don't know how, how if they will last after the pandemics, but uh, we can say that the pandemics was a very uh, interesting and important uh, exercise of uh, networking, or working together, and developing developing new uh, distribution schemes. So I'll try to talk a little bit about uh, about this. One element that uh, was very visible in uh, most of the initiatives that were were already selling food for middle class consumption uh, consumers or high class consumers is that uh, during the pandemic uh, they move. Uh, the farmers market was were very it's not that they were completely forbidden but uh, uh, the movement in the farmer market the capacity of the farmer ma farmers market to be this uh, place for food supply um, was not so strong and uh, they moved for uh, systems uh, of food baskets delivery and there was a, a lot of demand on that. And so this make us think uh, what uh, was happening, what during the pandemics, what people, it seems that people were uh, paying way more attention to what they were eating, to what they are they were buying. Uh, and also uh, we found out uh, that these networks were able uh, really to set up these distribution schemes using WhatsApp, using social networks. So this was kind of, uh, um, uh, I would say that they, 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 they went uh, one step uh, farther that uh, they had not done that before the pandemics. But uh, it was not only uh, the structuring of a new, uh, a new forms of reaching the consumption market. Uh, solidarity schemes, they flourish during the pandemic, connecting producer, producers, middle class consumers and people under food insecurity. So in most of these initiatives, uh, you have uh, middle class and high class consumers uh, willing to pay for food baskets to be distributed for free uh, in those um, uh, vulnerable communities. And these networks were able to sort of <coughs> intermediate this process. So, uh, what uh, what's very interesting is that people were trusting giving money for uh, these agents to to do uh, actions now nah, of uh, of social empowering of uh, access to food. So. Um, I don't know how how much this uh, our atmosphere will last uh, after the the pandemic, but this was a completely new thing, huh? and uh, it was also an important space uh, where uh, new ideas uh, relating to popular systems of uh, food supply uh, were able to expand. So this concept, a popular system of food supply, is a concept that is being uh, managed mostly by the movement of small farmers from the from the initiatives that we studied but it's sort of it's it sort of uh, um, underneath uh, most of these uh, ideas eh? so the idea that uh, healthy food agricultural food or organic food should be able to be in the favelas should be able to be in the peripheral communities and that uh, we should find uh, ways for for doing that and i think another concept that uh, became uh, strong 
was uh, what uh, uh, it was a concept that was uh, I would say that the, uh, the birth of this idea was in the National Council of Food Security but I think that now uh, this idea uh, is all all over the place that's the idea of comida de verdade né? that uh, in short lines could be uh, real food né? and the idea that people have the right to access healthy food and so when this, it's interesting that uh, when the um, agroecological food started to distribute, uh, to be distributed in the favelas, it generated different reactions. Né? In some places, uh, people felt that they, they were connecting again with the countryside. A lot of people who live in these communities in the peripheries of uh, Rio de Janeiro for instance, uh, they come from the countryside, but you, you, you have, we were able to document also reactions that was like, wow, this, this, this is not uh, the food we are used used to eat uh, on daily basis, right? because uh, the nutritional transition in Brazil is very uh, strong. It has going on for decades, so people uh, were substituting. Um, uh, non-processed foods by uh, processed foods by even for uh, eating um, eating what we call uh, lunch nah? not uh, not really a, an actual uh, meal and it was interesting because this was an opportunity for these people who working as mediators to discuss about uh, food quality nah? um, and also uh, some uh, challenges uh, regarding uh, the price of this food. Uh, so this is uh, when we look at the data uh, related to uh, how much uh, uh, action, uh, the dimension of actions of social, social responsibility in Brazil, there's a site, a uh, website that's doing what seems to be a very serious work tracking what these donations are. And they found that uh, already uh, from the beginning of the pandemic to October of the, this year, 6 billion reais were invested, uh, financing uh, different kinds of uh, initiatives, not only related to food, but many of them related to food. So uh, in, a, in a situation where we had this absence, uh, the but very... If I could ask, sorry to interrupt you, if I could ask you to wrap up in the next... Mm -hmm. Yes, just, that's the last on. slide. When we, we go to this action that uh, in a scenery of where public policies are being dismantled, we have them coming up into the scene, those actions of, uh, we have solidarity, now, but we have also uh, the social responsibility initiatives uh, that seems to be diminishing in the last uh, few months. So financing the initiatives now, is very uh, challenging. The, how, how do we keep going from here, at least at the scale that the networks were able to achieve? And uh, finally, uh, it's always the challenge, the cost of a uh, healthy food. So uh, we have instruments of pu public policy like uh, the institutional market that it would be possible to manage to distribute healthy food and to keep this action going. Uh, but um, the initiatives of social movement to have a strong program on, on that, uh, 1 billion investment from the government, uh, unfortunately it did not move uh, forward. So this is more or less the state we are at, and then I think we can discuss uh, further in the in the questions and in the discussion. Thanks, Claudia. Wonderful. Thanks very much for a very rich presentation. And uh, I'm now uh, introducing the second speaker. Uh, Les Levido is a senior research fellow at the Open University and co-editor of the Journal of uh, Science and uh, as Culture. Uh, he's interested in controversial socio-technical innovations as well as uh, agro-industrial systems, especially um, as well as alternative sorry, to agro-industrial systems, especially agroecological -eco practices linked with the solidarity economy. He currently leads the project Research Partnerships for an Agroecology-Based Solidarity Economy in Bolivia and Brazil. 
that is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council here in the UK. And I think Les will, uh, Les' presentation will have quite a lot of overlaps with what we've just heard from uh, Claudia. So over to you, Les. Hey, thanks for the opportunity and for the combination of speakers. You can hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah, if you okay. want to uh, just put your slides in present mode like before, that would be great. So you can see the slides, yes? You can see the slide. You just okay. uh, put it on presenter's mode. If you can. Ah, full, yeah. full size. Here we go. Whoop. Ah, it's already jumped. <laughs> okay, oh, so, here's great, the, yeah. so here's the title. Constructing a different normal beyond agri-modernization. Brazil's Ecoso Agroecology Networks respond to the COVID-19 crisis. As probably many of you know, the... Uh, Brazilian president responded to the crisis by denying that there was one. He called it hysteria. He called COVID-19 a gripazinho, just a mild flu that would not pose serious problems. So that response caused great fear and anxiety among people in Brazil, doubting that the government would do anything to protect them. And they protested in a socially distanced ways by banging pots and pans outside their windows all at the same time. It was called the panelasso. And many people took up a slogan which originated in the protests in Chile last year against neoliberal austerity. No volveremos a la normalidad porque la normalidad era el problema is projected onto the, the big wall of a building. We won't return to normality because normality was the problem. And the slogan took on much broader meanings about all of life, politics, production, consumption systems, and, and so on. There's an imperative to change the normality that was already creating social injustices and environmental degradation before the pandemic. So as Lydia mentioned, this talk comes from a project which started last January, and it will just focus on one of the three case studies, the Bachata Santista, which has a partner, the, the forum, the Economia Solidaria. Here is our logo. You know, emphasizing the leading role of women in all these activities. So as the general context in globally and especially in Latin America, many of the problems, including the pandemics, uh, impoverishment, land enclosures and so on, have resulted from an agri-modernization model based on uh, techno diffusion, which I'll explain. This modernization has shifted farmers' practices towards more complex technological tools and institutional arrangements, seeking a competitive advantage in distant markets. State and corporate structures have planned a societal change that can seize farmers in their communities as passive receptacles for new ways to do agriculture and generally capital intensive ways, rather than as social actors bringing their own projects, capacities and trajectories. So thanks to Long and Plug for that definition. And this features technology packages of the Green Revolution, originally hybrid seeds, more recently GM seeds, along with pesticides, fertilizers, machinery and so on, which throw many farmers into debt from which they often don't recover as well as degrading the environment. By contrast, knowledge-intensive agroecological methods use locally available natural resources towards an agriculture which is environmentally and socioeconomically sustainable. Such methods reproduce biodiverse seeds, maintain wider biodiversity for crop resilience, and recycle nutrients, together minimizing environmental harm. In the Global South, small-scale peasants supply 70% of local consumption, using much less land than agri-industrial agriculture, which mainly supplies export markets. And at least the majority of those small-scale peasants effectively use agri-ecological methods, even if they don't call it that. 
And agroecology agenda eventually became grounded in social agrarian agendas and social movements in resistance to the techno diffusionist model of agri modernization, especially in Latin America. So that's the, uh, the wider context of conflicts around agriculture, which in turn links with Economia Solidaria. This movement developed in parallel since probably the 1980s in Brazil, anticipating a more democratic society after they overthrew the dictatorship. So this promotes relationships of mutual aid, reciprocity, cooperation, both within enterprises and among them, in order to bypass dominant competitive markets. A key concept is circuitos cortos, or literally short circuits, but really meaning short supply chains, bringing producers closer to consumers who thereby better understand and support the production methods by buying the products. Uh, a central capacity is collective self-management of enterprises internally and, and external relationships, especially securitos curtos. Now, as uh, I think Lydia, uh, um, Claudia briefly mentioned, I mean, during the governments led by the Partido de Trabalhadores, PT, between 2003 and 2016, they established support measures for both agroecology and ecosol, especially for the collective capacities of social movements and producers. And all of this, of course, was in response to civil society demands, which had been growing long before that uh, first PT government. Eventually, those civil society groups promoting agroecology or ecosol converged in the sense that each took up the agenda of the other, you know, each referenced the basic concepts. Um, a, a turning point was the conference in 2011, which brought together all those groups. Now, in, in the agri-food sector, short supply chains has several forms. Uh, Small-scale producers consolidating their products for collective order marketing, especially through the PAAP, which is established by the first PT government. And that in turn provides access to the public procurement program, especially for school meals, the PENAI, which has a premium price offered to the, the, the uh, agroecological organic products. And then that in turn has provided a, a, a starting point for the agroecological producers to take part in or even initiate farmers markets, feras de agricultura, and in some cases to set up community supported agriculture with weekly food baskets for subscribers. So all, all of this existed you know, long before the pandemic, which then created a crisis it, it, uh, not only for health, but for the previous gains of having created those circuitos cortos on a solidarity basis, especially because the hygiene requirements, which were rightly imposed by the state governments, uh, imposed such great burdens on those means of direct sales. Here's just one of many newspaper headlines about the impact of the epidemic on direct sales. So the, the farmer's markets were not equipped to, to implement all those requirements. Most of them had no running water, being outside you know, outdoor venues. And all this led us to adjust our research questions. Because the original questions were written last year, of course, in the research proposal. And those were, how does eco so agroecology develop collective capacities? for sucritos cortos, what methods can help identify, strengthen, and spread these capacities? And we devised some new questions which compare the activities before and during the crisis. In these new conditions, how does solidaristic food position maintain or adapt the sucritos cortos? How do these activities extend previous means or create new ones? When the crisis began, there was an exemplary action by one cooperative, Univans in Puerto Alegre, which produced and distributed uh, free of charge face masks in large quantities 
to hospitals and other facilities. I mean, that was feasible because they were a fabric operation, which in, in turn had received the, the cotton, organic cotton, donated by just a trauma, which had been normally supplying the, the cotton to Univans. And this example was taken up in more modest ways by many initiatives all over the country, you know, and really set the uh, the tone for how people should respond through cooperation, mutual aid, solidarity. Now, as I mentioned before, our case study for this talk is the Bashada Santista, whose name comes from the main city, Santos, you can see with the airport. And it, it consists of eight fairly small towns with peri-urban agriculture, which either already existed or could be easily expanded, and where the producers can easily reach a central sales point in the town, such as uh, Fera de Agricultura. So those operations which already existed now faced a new obstacle. And the um, key means of circulating knowledge about these problems and solutions, again, was the forum, the Economia Solidaria, which for, henceforth I'll call FEBESP as its uh, abbreviation. Now we go back a few years, which I'm calling pre-pandemic capacity building. There were many federal programs, in particular, the Microbesias one on sustainable agricultural production methods, and especially microbusiness too, access to Marxists, which enabled newcomers, uh, especially low-income women, many of them from Quilombo origins, to gain the collective skills for accessing the government program. I mentioned before, the PEA, and this developed collective capacities for democratic self-management of their own collectives, cooperatives, and of the Secretus Cortos. And that in turn fed into the school food procurement system. Then beyond the federal programs, FEBESPI initiated several courses by bringing together various experts hosted by each municipality. For example, courses in non-conventional food plants, which can be the source of especially uh, attractive foods, even if it's new for most consumers. Um, and by contrast with the ultra processed food that is typical in supermarket chains, means of lightly processing food to con confer special aromas or tastes in many cases, reminding people of their favorite childhood foods. And so it's an extra means for the, the, the stall holders at the farmer's markets to establish a personal relationship with consumers. And then more ambitiously, the community-based tourism, emphasizing biodiversity in the broad sense, you know, as an attraction for tourists and as, as a, an extra means of protecting that biodiversity, uh, including its food uses, in the face of serious threats from heavy tourism and real estate development. The, these training courses also generated new networks, managers of the public policies for ECOSOL, especially civil servants or municipal officers who continued those connections afterwards and then you know, contributed as well to FEBESPI, as well as women's cooperatives such as ECOSOL Mujer, that is women's solidarity economy. And when the pandemic began, there was a fast response from a network called Bashara Santesti, la vida for life the slogan is we will conquer COVID-19 which which meant initially we'll conquer the fear and the social isolation by giving f food donations to families or individuals who were self-isolating ill elderly or who otherwise couldn't easily access food so this shows you one of the many, many volunteers who set up this system. By August, they were regularly feeding 9,000 people. I'd like to tell you much more about this, but I'll move on. Uh, and before I mention the FEDESPI, it began to hold these regular Urs de Converses, 
roundtable discussions to discuss, as you see in the title of this one, experiences, people's experiences of adapting to the pandemic and creating alternative means of supplying food in ways that comply with the restrictions. And, and those alternatives, of course, also were in the form of donations, either done with or, out, or separate from the municipality. Now I move on to th three of those towns, the largest one, Santos. So on, on the left, you see a sign which was typical. It was probably throughout the whole country. Let's keep the, the, the market alive, open in a safe way by following all these rules. Don't congregate around the stalls, maintain distance, use uh, alcohol to disinfect everything and so on. And in Santos, the Solidarity Network has a special name, Livres, which has a double meaning, at least one that means free of profit-seeking intermediaries or middlemen would be the more pejorative term, atrepresadores in Portuguese, and products free of agrochemicals. So it, at least that double meaning, as well as a broader political meaning, perhaps about collective freedom Here's a, a group photograph uh, with, with the full name, Olivares Consumidores Conscientes, Conscientious Consumers, which means spreading a, an, agro, a, an ecological consciousness about how food is produced in different ways, in destructive ways or beneficial ways. But I'll have to leave that. And now when they set up an alternative distribution system for delivering to alternative pickup points or people's homes, they also needed a new intermediary. In this case, it was a Eco Bikers Collective, which had already existed for several years and then was mobilized to do the food deliveries uh, along or in coordination with Olivres. Now I move on to the second town, Peruibe, which already had a solidarity network with the slogan, Construindo una nueva realidad, is constructing a new reality. It is a vision of a more just, ecologically sustainable society through cooperation, as you see in the logo. And again, before the pandemic, here are some photos from my visit there. So you see the Women's Union of Peruibi on the left, symbolizing a broad range of problems facing women. And then a solution, the, uh, the Ecosomelier helping to you know, support the development of a farmer's market run by women. Up in the corner it says Productor Rural. And then here's after the pandemic began, then the same stalls had everybody, of course, wearing the face mask. And cheap or free face masks were being provided by the solidarity networks, often with support from the municipality. And when they realized it, it would be too difficult to continue the farmer's market in that small space and comply with the hygiene restrictions, they invented a virtual fair you know, Facebook pages with the, the names of each producer, the products on offer, the, the mobile phone number for a WhatsApp arrangement for deliveries. And since then, I understand this, the list has expanded from 10 individuals to 25 cooperatives selling a wide range of products, including food. Now I moved to the third city, and I am, Where, whose Fede de Agricultor yeah, was able to stay open and, and supply these uh, face masks. In this case, I just wanted to show you the visual pun. It says, we sell organic face masks. With a double meaning. And what made Ethan I am different, yeah, I'll skip this for lack of time, is that 
in previous years, it had already developed the Banco de Alimentos food bank, but with a totally different meaning than we associate here, because its main role was a storage depot for the large quantities of food being purchased from the uh, local small scale producers, especially the Guanari community, for supplying the food uh, to school meals. Now, including the uh, traditional maize, which had a special you know, sacred meaning for the Guanares. And so it was a matter of great pride that this was now being supplied to the schools attended by their children. There was another operation to connect the Guanari fishermen to a mechanical process to extract the meat the, the flesh, and then use that as a substitute for meat in the school meals, thus you know, benefiting everyone, the, the Guanari and the children who had now more nutritious food. Now that's just background to the role played by the Banco de Alimentos, but then during the pandemic, it took on this extra role of soliciting donations of food and hygiene materials in a drive-through arrangement so that uh, people could feel they'd be safe just driving up there and depositing it in a box. A so, minutes, I, yeah, so, so I move to conclusion pretty quickly. So now before the pandemic, going back, eco, eco agroecology agenda has expanded over the past decade or more, resulted from a convergence between prior ones for agroecological production methods and solidaristic economic activities. Civil society networks demanded and gained support measures from federal agencies, especially capacity building and knowledge exchange processes. These have facilitated secretos cortos, bringing producers closer to consumers. They develop collective capacities for self uh, democratic self-management and various proximities, a concept that has been uh, conceptualized by, especially by the, the networks in the Bachata Santista, for example, a socio-cultural proximity involves quality food in the multiple sense of artisanal production methods, lightly processed, um, sp specific food traditions. These are communicated to consumers by producers and the solidaristic intermediaries. An organizational proximity involves mutual aid relationships within each stakeholder group, producers, consumers, and between them, often with municipal support. Now, the COVID-19 crisis potentially jeopardized the safety of customers and the products uh, in the Federalist to Agriculture, with solutions dependent on creative adjustments by multi-stakeholder networks. Along with municipalities, solidarity networks help the fairs to comply with the hygiene requirements or else to devise alternative delivery methods which did so as a basis to warrant and maintain consumer trust. This involved new solidaristic intermediaries such as the Eco Bikers co Cooperative. Some producers swap surplus products or consolidate them. This arrangement improved consumers' food diversity, product quality and producers' income sometimes through collective marketing. So many more people became involved as producers, volunteers, and or consumers, especially through social media tools, Facebook and WhatsApp. So despite the obstacles from the pandemic, these solidarity networks have been expanding Socrates Curtos, popularizing these as an economy of proximity and raising their public profile. They gained opportunities to promote this agenda as an alternative future through social media, mass media, such as local newspapers and radio, and the November local elections, in which their supporters did very well. The further expansion depends on integrating diverse expertise, developing collective capacities, attracting more participants, extending the various proximities that I mentioned before, involving new solidaristic intermediaries, and gaining or maintaining support measures from local authorities, which still often have a commitment to this agenda, and inspiring similar practices and more sites. In this way, Ecoso Agroecology Networks have contested the techno diffusionist agri modernization model, thus counterposing a different normal 
for the future of society. So I conclude there. Thanks, Les. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for bringing a complementary perspective to what Claudia presented, and, and especially the emphasis on relations of trust, solidarity, and this notion of uh, economy of proximity, which I think is inter interesting and we should come back to. We're running a little bit um, behind uh, time, so um, please bear with us. And uh, just as a reminder that you can start typing your questions and comments in the Q&A box or indeed the chat box. But let me now move on to our um, third speaker, Andre Degenschein, who is uh, coming from uh, Ibirapitanga Institute and brings us a perspective on how Brazilian foundations are supporting some of these initiatives. So André is the uh, executive director of Ibirapitanga. He has a, a master's in international relations from the, the Pontifical Catholic University in Sao Paulo, uh, was a professor of international relations at Santa Catarina, Santa Marcelina, uh, excuse me, University. Um, and he was the secretary general of the Brazilian Association of Institutes, Foundations and Companies. He was also one of the founders and is currently a member of the board of uh, the NGO Connect as Human Rights. And he serves also on the board of Oxfam Brazil. So over to you, André. Uh, thanks a lot, Lydia. Uh, first, uh, I thank, thank uh, ADS for the invitation. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to, to be sharing this panel with Claudia and, and Les. And I think my, uh, my brief presentation here will, will establish uh, some dialogue with what they have already shared with us. But very briefly, Ibirapitanga is a family foundation based in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, we work on two programs, uh, one on uh, food systems, uh, which is what brings us together uh, in this conversation, but the other one is uh, oriented towards uh, racial justice. Um, and I'll, I'll be primarily speaking from, from some of the experiences that we've been supporting for the past years at Ibirapitanga is a, it's a fairly new foundation. It was established, it started operating in 2018. Um, and I, I tried to draw from, from some of the examples of uh, partnership we've, we've been establishing and, and trying to relate them to some of the questions that uh, were driving uh, our conversation uh, today. Uh, but first, I'd like just to uh, to refer back to uh, some of the things that um, uh, Claudia and, and Les shared. But mostly, uh, we've been focusing on the on the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. But uh, before that, uh, Brazil was facing uh, its own uh, political pandemic, which uh, strongly impacted the food systems. Uh, when uh, Les mentioned uh, two of the largest uh, food programs, uh, very well-known public policies that uh, for long have, you know, uh, contributed uh, to uh, food security in Brazil, the the PAA, the the public, uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm translating the best way, but the public procurement uh, program was almost entirely defunded with the uh, Bolsonaro's administration. And the PA has been for many years uh, uh, an important entry point for small uh, farmers to be able to, you know, to to sell their produce and 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 if they, you know, were able to uh, get stronger and and access the the school procurement program, which is a, a larger program, is still ongoing but largely threatened uh, by the pandemic. Uh, because the schools were out and, and we were faced with a, a huge uh, challenge in terms of um, securing uh, that these families, these uh, children uh, had access to food. Uh, we have two uh, projects that Ibirapitanga is supporting uh, and they are ongoing right now, but they, they will uh, provide some, uh, some valuable insights on these two fronts. One of them related to um, an initiative called uh, Comida de Verdade, uh, Real Food, which is aimed at uh, identifying uh, agroecological experiences related to the COVID-19 pandemic that have emerged. So I think uh, it's very likely that we'll have a, a more comprehensive view on, on, on how this changed and, and what we're seeing as new responses uh, from agroecological uh, practices towards the pandemic. 
uh, but it, it's too soon to to uh, to uh, you know to draw conclusions for, for from that uh, study. And the other one is uh, is an observatory of the of PINAI, the Food uh, School Procurement Program, which is aimed mostly at understanding how is how the program is responding uh, to the current situation and how uh, uh, small farmers and other um, uh, networks are supporting and and uh, are able to to maintain at least uh, partially the program running uh, throughout this crisis. Which is lasting uh, maybe more than we we first uh, predicted. Um, I, I, I will bring uh, three examples of uh, experiences that we've been funding that I think relate in different terms to some of the questions that were uh, uh, presented, um, mostly regarding how these networks uh, relate to uh, traditional or established food chains and and how they differ from each other. The first one, and I'd say this is the, the first level of response, uh, it's a program that was developed by Hedges da Maré, which is a, an, an important NGO operating uh, within the Maré uh, favelas, which is one of the largest uh, favelas in Rio, uh, over 100,000 people. And they, they designed a, a, a sort of a, an emergency response program to ensure that these low-income families had access to food. Um, and, and the main drive was uh, buying from local uh, markets, informal uh, markets, to ensure that they had uh, some income, which uh, was threatened with the pandemic, while being able to distribute uh, food within the community. And, and as, as a rapid response a scheme, it had, let's say, uh, a low perspective on, on developing uh, food chains or, or, uh, or a lack of any agroecological perspective to it. It was mostly uh, an emergency response. And we've seen this happening in different uh, areas. And uh, I believe uh, Les uh, made reference to, to this you know, arrangements. And the other one, the second one that I, I wanted to share with you, uh, which was already uh, also mentioned by Claudia, is the small farmers movement, um, which I think, uh, you know, the program we supported, uh, they operated in seven different states in Brazil. They draw on a, let's say, a large capacity of mobilization of uh, small farmers which ensured, uh, let's say, a, a large amount of food being uh, bought from the small uh, producers and, and being delivered in a, let's say, in a large scale, but at very, uh, also uh, very, um, how can I say, reaching, you know, uh, the, the, the most vulnerable communities uh, with, with a, like, let, a stronger perspective on, securing uh, of strengthening this uh, food chains uh, and ensuring access to healthy foods. Uh, we've seen during the pandemic also, which is uh, also uh, an element of critical interest for Ibirapitanga, which is the increase in the consumption of ultra processed foods. So without this uh, chains and this um, concerted efforts, uh, what we would very likely see is a, a, a hard increase in the consumption of this class of product, which uh, it's easier to you know to to maintain and to distribute. So the capacity of mobilizing uh, these food chains is also a way of uh, of ensuring a, a higher pattern of of healthy foods being accessed by um, uh, vulnerable uh, families, particularly during the pandemic. So this, uh, this is, uh, let's say it's a, it's a fairly good example of, uh, of a food chain or, that was established in, uh, as a parallel to a, the traditional um, uh, food chains, but with a, a high capacity of mobilization, uh, ensuring like income to small uh, farmers, but also uh, the engagement of, uh, of social movements and, and, and vulnerable families served by the program. And the third example that I wanted to, uh, to bring, um, it's, uh, it's a project that we've been supporting for, for a longer term. Um, it's uh, been almost uh, two to three years. 
and it's an initiative aimed uh, at connecting two agroecological networks, one from the south of Brazil, uh, the Ecovida, and another one uh, located in the south of, of Bahia. It's a northeastern state called Povos da Mata. So the main purpose of this uh, project is um, establishing um, a commercial point in, in Sao Paulo that will be able to uh, create a, a, a selling point. I'm not using the best words to describe it, but to be able to bring uh, um, uh, food that is being produced by small uh, farmers with agroecological uh, uh, practices in the south of Bahia and in the south of Sao Paulo. Um, creating a, a, a a, a commercialization channel for this uh, for these producers, and during the pandemic, we supported the increase uh, of the capacity of production in this network, mainly targeting uh, a, a large favela in the city of São Paulo called Paraisópolis. And this um, and this is an effort that is trying to to bridge. Uh, this uh, agroecological circuit with more traditional uh, uh, food chains. Uh, and although the scale is much smaller than what we've seen with the uh, with MPA or with this uh, emergency effort at the favela, uh, the Mare uh, favela, this is something that we believe uh, is likely to be sustained uh, in the long run as this is drawing uh, from, let's say, uh, established circuits and, and, and the pandemic might be um, uh, a way to sort of um, strengthen uh, this, this channel. And what we probably could achieve in the longer term uh, was, you know, was um, improved with the, with the need that the pandemic uh, imposed. Um, so I think together with this uh, two other examples that I, I mentioned that, that are likely to bring more uh, elements to this uh, conversation, what we are seeing is uh, I think in the previous presentations that was uh, was made very clear that although they face uh, sometimes we we can see this as um, as a very complex network of simple problems. So when we describe this in a more, let's say, a, a quicker overview, maybe we're lacking uh, or, or um, under, under, uh, underscoring the, the many challenges that we see in structural terms to, to ensure that this, uh, this chains uh, flow uh, more naturally. Um, but at least we are being able to see uh, some um, some possibilities that can be strengthened uh, in years to come, uh, maintaining after the pandemic. Uh, so we're very interested in understanding what have emerged during this period uh, out of the normal uh, context that we can nurture and that may contribute to create that, you know, uh, not this, uh, this new normal that uh, Les mentioned not returning to uh, a previous state, but trying to uh, make effective and long lasting changes. So I uh, thank you. And I hope we have some time for, uh, for, for questions and comments from the audience. Indeed, thank you very much, Andre, and, and thank you for bringing in this, uh, this sense of hope that there are some, some patterns that suggest that some of these changes might be sustainable, might be sustained over the long term. Because some, I think one of the concerns is that uh, the solidarity response that we've seen quickly emerging was uh, short-lived in many ways, right? So how to ensure that uh, the spirit is maintained and, uh, and that some of these networks are, are, are sustained over the long term and they do contribute to looking at cult you know, changing cultures of consumption, but also changing cultures of, uh, of food provision and commercialization. I want to move on to uh, uh, the audience immediately. So just a reminder, do add uh, your questions. There's, uh, there's a couple of ones, a long question coming, coming uh, up from uh, Alex Shankland, uh, my colleague from IDS. 
thanks, Alex. So I'll just, uh, this is a question directed to Claudia, but in, indeed it connects to points that, uh, that Les and Andre have also made. So I think we, you can all uh, comment on, on it. So in relation to particularly the issue of uh, comida de verdade, food, food for real, this isn't a food we're used to responses. So among solidarity food baskets uh, recipients in favelas, has the research team gained any insight into whether the positive appeal of real food is likely to be there in the post pandemic moment to be able to counterbalance the factors that we, we know tend to, to encourage low income women to prefer industrialized uh, packaged foods. Um, and is the absence of high level government support of, of the kind available a decade ago, uh, in the absence of that support, right, uh, in the current uh, political uh, setting, what strategies, for example, the preparation value uh, adding training that Les mentioned, what strategies might help to make this a more temporary pause in a um, and then an inexorable, inexorable transition to ever more processed food for low income urban consumers. So, so we're really, uh, uh, sorry, a long one there, but, uh, but to an extent, you know, given the current uh, moment for the political moment that, uh, that really Brazil is living, what might be the, the strategies to ensure that this becomes indeed a better normal? Uh, so that's one from, uh, from Alex. There's another question here from Mario Bestetti. Um, so we shall read out as well. One of the difficulties I have seen in the interior of the state of Bahia is the problem of logistics, which reinforces the strengthening of short sales consumption circuits, especially due to the problem of logistic costs versus reduced sales. Otherwise, the increase in the use of social networks as a way to sell their products has been one of the ways out for small farmers to be able to maintain themselves requiring a great effort of learning in the use of new technologies. So this is a, a comment and a, a, more of a comment <laughs> coming from Mario Bestetti from the Institute of Social Design and Sustainability uh, from uh, uh, talking about Chapada Diamantina Bahia, Brazil. And, and finally, a question from Fernanda La Rocha, Regional Technical Specialist of um, IFAD for the Latin America Caribbean region. So thank you for thanking me all for the presentations. Uh, he'll have to leave, she'll have to leave. Let me just the first, but I'll leave some topics for discussion. The first relates to the link with public policies. While in the current political scenario, many national public policies that supported agroecology and localized food systems were dismantled, mobilizing public policies at the state level has resulted uh, in successful, successful in IFAD funded projects in Northeast uh, Brazil, in Bahia and Ceará, for example. The second topic that Fernando wants to propose relates to the role of the private sector and a question, how could we mobilize private sector actors to support this paradigm? So three, three uh, quite large questions there. Let me just throw one to the pot and then allow you all to uh, um, have a couple of minutes to respond. I wanted to uh, ask specifically about um, uh, the role of the intermediaries uh, that were mentioned um, in some of your presentations, the intermediaries that are bringing together producers and consumers and uh, that seem to have been driven in, in this uh, recent moment by a sort of a solidarity sort of spirit. Um, I wanted to, uh, you uh, to comment on how this, how different this new intermediary role is to the average middle person or broker and how can the uh, solidarity ethos that might have, uh, you know, uh, excited and mobilized people uh, during this pandemic, how can that be sustained uh, over the long term? So a connection that to, uh, also to the, uh, the question that Alex uh, raised. So I'll open up, I uh, suggest we are going the order of presenters. So Claudia and then Les and then Andre, if you can offer some quick, uh, some quick reflections, responses to, to these questions, uh, that would be great, thank you. Okay, the questions are very deep and I have uh, have the sensation we could talk uh, for a long time. And thank you so much, Liz and Andre, for the presentations and re they really make me think a lot of things. I will start with the processed foods. 
I think uh, one, one thing that uh, struck us from data that came from the field was the fact that uh, these networks were starting to be able to reach uh, our uh, women uh, from say 25, 30s, 40s that uh, usually they were not able to reach when they were working with urban agriculture and agroecology and all of that because these women are uh, working so hard and they uh, have to go uh, right two hours, three hours to, to reach their work. So, uh, I, uh, so uh, if we think a little bit about this, we will find a connection uh, between uh, uh, what uh, these women are go these women are going through and uh, the processed foods. Because you, you, you arrive home, you are tired. I'm not minimizing uh, uh, the access issue. I think there is an access issue related to price, but that's, it's also related to convenience. Right? So people finally were at home and then they were able uh, in some places to participate, to rodas de, to, to rodas de conversa, to, to, uh, to say uh, talks related to healthy food and all of that. So uh, when we start to unpacking, unraveling the, 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 uh, this issue related to processed foods, uh, we find a, a whole range of issues. One of them, uh, I think there is a very strong uh, lobby from the big corporations related to processed food. During the pandemic, we experienced in Brazil a very harsh uh, attack to a public policy instrument that's the guide for um, orientations from the Ministry of Health uh, re regarding healthy food that uh, two agronomists build uh, from a uh, link to the Ministry of Agriculture. They uh, build a, a technical position uh, against uh, the advices that were in this guide that was uh, built by uh, 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 people from expertise from nutrition and health at uh, USP at the University of Sao Paulo and they wanted to erase from the guide the advice that you you should avoid the uh, processed foods so there's a whole uh, a whole range of issues related to food and power uh, regarding this. But I think, yes, we do have some uh, strategies to, to work in these places. Um, one of them being uh, the public equipment, uh, supplying uh, diversified foods and healthy foods that we have been able in many places to, to, to have. Um, uh, this food supply through the uh, institutional market, like PIA and other programs that Liz, both Liz and Andrea talked about. So this public equipment, they have a role not only on make uh, uh, healthy food and comida de verdade accessible for a lot of people, but I think also they have, I'm sure they also, they have an educational role. So people, uh, so children start to eat different kinds of food at school and they start to demand these foods at home but then you you have to be able to to access na, and uh, supply and i think we have at least uh, three ways of supplying this that we have to work on uh, including with uh, public policy one is the collective e equipment i think the other one is really uh, to to have in this peripheral neighbors, it's, it's, it's some issue related to food environment, to, to have a um, farmer's market, to have uh, ways to deliver that. If, even if you have to subsidize at some level this, uh, one of the uh, organizations we studied, they had a very interesting experience called uh, Shepa Organica. The shepa is what's the leftover from uh, uh, a farm, uh, a fair or a, a market. And then uh, people would collect leftovers from uh, uh, ecological food that was at the middle class and uh, high income uh, neighbor, uh, neighborhoods and uh, make it accessible for people in the favelas. And it, it was not uh, like uh, food that was uh, bad or degraded. It was good food, just uh, leftover. So 
you, you need at some level to operate with, I, I think, hybrid schemes that are market and non-market. And the third uh, element uh, would be urban agriculture. Even if you have a small space and all of that, but already you start to get connected in this idea and trying to produce a little bit. So I think we have all other uh, issues and questions né, about subnational policies and everyone, but I think we should hold the letter to Liz and Andrea to make their comments. Thanks, Claudia. Les, a couple of minutes. Please unmute yourself. I'll speak to three of the issues that were was raised, I hope, briefly. You can hear me OK? OK, so uh, intermediaries as a new kind of issue. Because uh, well, before the pandemic, that term, uh, intermediario, had a pejorative meaning in this whole area. It meant you know, profit-seeking uh, people or companies that are you know, extracting value from, from the producers. But uh, through the necessity of alternative means to deliver the food, then the, there was the realization, well, we need solidaristic intermediaries. So we'll, we'll choose uh, atravesadores, middleman is the pejorative term, but then what kind of intermediaries? So in some cases they are formal cooperatives like the eco-bikers. In other cases, more generally, it's voluntary labor and people may be very enthusiastic to help or to get some nominal payment, but that may not be viable as a long-term strategy. And in the Leavely's, uh, the coordinator half jokingly said, well, we have no capitalist exploiters, but we exploit ourselves. And of course, enthusiasm and solidarity can persevere, but not indefinitely. So there needs to be an arrangement for remunerating people in a way that they see as fair as a, at least a medium term solution rather than just assuming that so much voluntary labor can continue indefinitely. So that's an, a, a practical issue that I'm sure is being discussed. On uh, consumer habits, expectations, yes, well, it, it was interesting insight as well from the Libres because they're now delivering so many food baskets to people who previously uh, had little knowledge or interest in alternatives. I mean, perhaps they choose the food baskets because they, they uh, trust more in the hygiene precautions or for convenience or for whatever the reason. And, but then they're surprised to see that it's a combination of products which changes from week to week or month to month some products they never saw before. What is this? What should I do with that? And this then becomes a, a necessity and opportunity for consumer education about the global food system that you know, through the normal habits of buying in supermarket chains, people are accustomed to seeing the same food products there all the time. Um, coming from wherever in the world is, is able to supply it at that moment. So the Livres try to do education about the necessity of accepting or enjoying seasonal food that is locally produced food, which will change from season to season and uh, recipes for make turning those foods into tasty meals and so on. So it it's, becomes a lot more than just selling the food basket. It be, becomes a symbol and instrument of consumer education about the unhealthy food system and this alternative. And then the, the public policies, I mean, as uh, Claudia mentioned, yes, I mean, since 2016, the, various governments have degraded or even abolished 
some of the support measures. So this now poses a great difficulty, especially for any new initiatives to, to learn the, the collective skills necessary to gain the public policies insofar as they are still available in principle. The state level may be different because as I think one question noted, a couple of states have maintained their support and this is still a political struggle throughout the country. I mean, state governments that that try to withdraw their support or reduce it then face public protest, and that that would have been an extra few minutes at least in the story of the Bachata Santista with his solidarity network that has been mounting protests, highlighting the uh, the need to continue those programs. Now, which have the support of most municipalities or at least some officers in those municipalities and they do what they can but but with much less funds available from the federal government that, that's the main problem and, and and they tried to make this a, a major issue in the local elections that just happened where well generally left-wing candidates who generally support these policies Know, did much better than in the previous elections, and perhaps in the, even if they're not elected in, in the runoff, then that would se send a warning signal to po the uh, politicians in power, you know, as guards, you know, whether they're going to reduce or abolish these programs. So I had my case study. Now, thankfully, in, I mean, from a research standpoint, in, in an area where these networks were already well established before the drastic reduction in the programs and, the, and before the pandemic, so they were able to continue and even expand in some cases. But it would be much more difficult in a place that didn't already have those networks in place. So I'll stop there. Thanks, uh, thanks, Les. And uh, Andre, some final words from you, reacting to some of the comments and questions or anything you would like to, to emphasize Thank you. at this point. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, I'll be very uh, short as I know we are running out of time, but I just wanted to, uh, to comment on Alex's point regarding <laughs> ultra-processed foods. Um, we have recently published a study uh, that's available at Ibirapitanga's website that was developed by Professor Walter Bellick. In one of the findings, which uh, sort of reinforces uh, uh, one perception that for some time has been supported by the, the new pains and Professor Carlos Monteiro regarding the uh, consumption of ultra processed foods that what we, we are seeing is that as, as the income increases, the consumption of rice and beans uh, is reduced. So uh, sometimes it, it, it might be counterintuitive in how uh, the income relates to consumption of ultra processed foods. Uh, at the same time, as, as I recognize what Alex is raising, uh, the point that he's raising in terms of, you know, the, the, you know, the convenience and speed and, and accessibility of ultra processed food by low income families. What we have seen so far is that uh, the consumption of rice and beans too plays a very relevant role. And, and as, as the income increases, it tends to be reduced. So we might be uh, at, at, a, at a turning point, but uh, as, as we stand, this is still uh, an interesting uh, balance because for, for low income families, rice and beans, well, rice had some problems recently, but it's still more accessible than uh, some ultra processed foods. So just wanted to, to mention, because uh, this requires uh, sometimes a closer look to see how uh, that, that uh, relate. Um, but in general, and I think that refers to another question regarding the public, uh, the, the private sector. I think um, it's, it's uh, certainly the private sector can play a very strong role in situations like this. But when we look at uh, in terms of uh, connection between food and, and, and health, uh, it's always challenging as when the private sector jumps in, we're looking mostly at the role of uh, supermarkets um, and the, the food industry. So 
in both both ends it tends to uh, reinforces the you know the the space taken by ultra processed foods rather than uh, um, healthy and and non processed uh, food as we we've, we've been speaking so I just wanted to make this quick uh, remark you will find more information at this study uh, that we've just published. Thanks, Andre, and thanks to everyone. We're now reaching the end of this uh, webinar. Apologies for going a little bit over time. Thanks for all the participants for staying with us. And uh, you know, thanks for the, to the two, three presenters for, for a really insightful uh, session with fresh evidence from the field, which is very, very much still you know, being processed and understood. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's starting to to connect and to inform you know the bigger questions and debates about food justice, about the changing food economy, this idea of proximity and an economy of proximity and the importance of building trust uh, as part of uh, of, um, of food relations, and also questions about what's the role of the state, of foundations, of social actors in the pursuit of justice. So I think for me, I, I, I live with a sense of uh, cautious optimism. I think there's reasons to be positive in, in, from, from what we see emerging, but I think there's, uh, there's, there's a need to continue monitoring the space and, and see how these networks evolve to really understand the extent to which they, they are able to change uh, cultures of consumption, but, but also uh, change uh, cultures of food provisioning and, uh, and, and transactions over, over the longer term. Um, so I would also like to thank to my IDS colleagues, uh, Rachel Dixon and, and Gary Edwards for their work backstage. Uh, and just a reminder to, to everyone that the recording of the seminar will be, uh, will be available uh, on the uh, event page. I think a link has been posted in the chat box. So let's close here, have a wonderful rest of the day and I hope to see many of you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Obrigado. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Yeah, that's much. <laughs>